Well, it's good to be back. I've been off for a couple of weeks touring India. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my experiences because I think they relate to the lesson today, which is the second half of Colossians 3, and we'll go all the way to the end of Colossians. I uh, included this picture of a Bengal tig tiger, which we saw in Rothenburg. Uh, has nothing to do with the lesson today. I just thought it was spectacular. And we were fortunate to see three wild Bengal tigers while we were there. Uh, I like to start too with uh, news you might have missed. And this actually pertains to the lesson later on. Um, Captain Singh and all Sikhs last name are Singh. Uh, he sued the government to uh, wear his turban and keep his long hair while serving in the military. He's a ranger and a captain. And on Friday, I saw in the news that uh, the Department of Defense is going to allow him to continue uh, wearing this. In the past, the Army has been against having long hair, particularly beards, because a gas mask won't fit. We'll come back to this. Uh, let's start by reading Colossians 3, 14 to 17. And it says, Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through him. Well, in 14, it says, above all, put on uh, all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. <laughs> Well, I kind of hate this command because it cramps my style. And i tell you a little story about when we were in India. It was hot. I mean, really hot. It was like 100 degrees. It was crowded. Uh, we were a kilometer from the Pakistan-Indian border. A guy had been, had not been allowed by the uh, military there to accompany us to the Pakistani border. And as we were walking along, my wife, she doesn't tolerate heat very well. And uh, she was miserable. And I thought, well, if I miss the ceremony, it won't be the end of the world. She's more important. So I offered to return to the bus or just stop and sit in the shade. But she soldiered on, and we made it uh, to the border and were ushered into our section. It was a VIP gallery. I use that with <laughs> humor because uh, there was a VIP section, and I'll show you that. But notice the large crowds. Uh, there were very few Westerners in this crowd, and it was kind of like going to a football game. It the excitement and the cheering, and they actually had a cheerleader down front. And on one side of the border, you would hear Pakistan, and on our side of the border, it would be Hindustan. Well, there were only uh, six of us uh, in our group that went to this ceremony. And... Uh, well, it was just exciting. Uh, it's called choreographed contempt. And if you look here, you can see, uh, there we go. You can see they run the flags from this area. This is the uh, cheerleader. They run them down to the border. They turn around and they run back. And uh, people cheer as they go. The last flag bearers, and all of these people here are going to carry flag, uh, the last couple were Westerners, and they just got tremendous cheers from the audience. Well, this has been called choreographed contempt with good reason. Uh, you have high-stepping soldiers on both sides, fake anger and aggressiveness, but it begins with uh, they come out and just volunteer to dance, Bollywood dancing. If you haven't seen Bollywood dancing, you should watch Dancing with the Stars or get a Bollywood movie. Uh, they're wonderful, like Lagan is just superb. And they then uh, had the children stay and they danced in a circle. Uh, I like this picture because here are two Western girls that were dancing and 
the Indians really uh, enjoyed that, took a lot of pictures of them. This uh, over here in the left-hand corner gives you a sense of the crowd, huge crowd. We were quite in the minority being Westerners. Well, to look at the gate, uh, we had uh, the sun in our eyes. It was hot. And uh, the, the soldiers insisted that everyone sit. Uh, now, when we went there, the guide hastily told us, don't sit at the top, don't sit, that's what I heard, and don't sit at the bottom. So we sat in the middle. And uh, I will try to show you just a taste of, ah, uh, here we go. This is uh, some of the choreographed contempt. These are the soldiers. Uh, they march to the border. They have high kicking style. This is the VIP gallery. We were in the quote the VIP section here, and here's the border. Now they wanted all, everyone to sit, but these folks were too important to sit, and so they blocked our view. And I'll come back to that in a minute. I'm going to try to show you a little bit of. Uh, I'm not going to be able to show you that because it's gone. Uh, I took it off, but you can go to YouTube and watch. Uh, a little snippet of the ceremony. They're high-stepping soldiers and it's very interesting and entertaining. But the sun was in our eyes. We couldn't really see very well and the guards didn't have the VIP sit. And so when we returned to the bus afterwards, I tried to explain to the guide that perhaps he ought to tell people to sit at the very top and he vehemently insisted that he had told us that uh, he had told us to sit at the top and really treat me like a dummy. And it made me quite mad. Um, and right after that, one of the other fellows who was with him was raving about his pictures because he'd sit up above. And I was angry because of the way the guy treated me. I was angry because nobody had said anything. I love the story as an aside. Uh, the family was having dinner together, and uh, the old man kept saying, uh, excuse me, repeat that, because he couldn't hear. And the daughter finally said, you need a hearing aid. And Grandpa looked at her and said, hand grenade? What am I going to do with a hand grenade? Well, that's where I am. I hear things, but I don't hear them correctly all the time. And I wear hearing aids. And... Anyway, the whole thing just made me angry. And so verse 15 says, let peace rule in your heart. I, this is the final sort of thing where they're going on. See how people are squinting here in this area? Come on, in this area. And here they're carrying the Indian flag off. They they lower the, both the Pakistani and Indian flag together. Well, in 15, it says, let the peace of God, uh, peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Yeah, right. I, I, I want to explain that seats higher up would have been better, but he blew me off and I kind of lost it. And then it says, uh, be thankful. And uh, it goes on to talk about thankfulness in verse 16. I should have read that. And it, that is what brought me around. Because once I got some alone time, I began to realize that I'd seen most of the ceremony. I enjoyed it. I didn't get great pictures of it. But I really enjoyed it. And I was giving a bad witness. And if that wasn't enough, in verse 17, again, it says, give thanks. It's interesting that it's said three times. It's kind of the holy number. And I realized that I was giving a a poor witness and so I focused on what I could be thankful for and I realized being angry wasn't accomplishing anything and people were watching me so we met down in the lounge and I don't drink but everybody else had drinks and we had good fellowship and I just tried to let it blow over now I'll admit I woke up at 2 in the morning to go to the bathroom regular pit stop and that anger returned and I had to sit and read my Bible for a while to flush that emotion. And after that, I slept well. So for me, it's easier to love the dirty or the poor or the underprivileged than an obnoxious or rude person. Now, a loving way to handle this issue uh, would have been to ignore his rudeness and 
gently persist in trying to make him understand that I wasn't trying to attack him. I was trying to be helpful. So I needed to... another block caller, <laughs> another robocall block. So I need to let the peace of God be uh, the umpire of my heart. And normally I'd call for comments here, and we got some good ones. You can think about what you might have said. Let's move on and read uh, Colossians 3, 18 to uh, 4, 1. And remember that when the, the uh, verses and the chapters in the Bible were created, it was a bit arbitrary. And so sometimes chapters don't end exactly where you might expect them. This is an instance. So it says, wives, submit to your husbands as in fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those that who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service or as people pleasers, but with the sincerity of heart fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bond service justly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now, what's interesting about this is that the word uh, um, Lord, <laughs> sorry, I had a block there. The word Lord is used seven times. The number of completeness. Now, it begins with focus on your wise and, uh, and really not on yourself. Uh, Paul elevates the relationship in the family outside the norm of the times, even for today. Uh, back then, women had no status. Uh, in Jewish courts, they really couldn't be a witness, and uh, they, they couldn't own property. Uh, they were dependent totally on their husband. So Jesus and Paul saw women as individuals, as people and persons of worth. And in the family of God, there is no distinction between men and women. So it says, love your wives. It does not say make love to your wives. That needs no command. Love is sacrificial. And unless we're placing our wives above self, we're not loving. Now, in India, women are clearly lesser citizens. It's a man's world. And our guide informed us of that the first day, and we saw evidence of it. And I saw that when we visited a home. Uh, as we went into the home, you can see in this picture the cow patties that have been formed into round pads. This is a stack of them, and this is a stack of them. They'll be used for fuel. For our sake, they use wood as the fuel to heat the water, bottled water, for tea. And this is mamaji. Uh, G is an honorific added to a word. Like in Japan, they would say mama-san. She's mamaji. And behind her are her daughters sitting on the patio of their house. And we uh, sat around in a circle and had tea. But when we first got there, there just uh, wasn't enough room. She'd already started making the tea with a little fire here. There wasn't enough room. And uh, Papa G said we needed uh, more seating space. So she interrupted her work over this fire to go get this bed for us to sit on. She carried it out all by herself. Papa G, standing right next to her, offered no help. We all sat there with our eyes wide open and our mouths open as well, amazed that he offered no help. A little later, she dropped an instrument, I think it was this one, it rolled away, and right next to his foot. And he didn't reach down and pick it up. He ignored it totally. And she took the uh, wisp here and pulled it back closer and picked it up. Now, some of us wanted to pick it up for her, but we were embarrassed about the situation. We didn't want to interfere. Kind of wanted to see how it would play out. 
he, he, at the end, he went around and offered people tea. She'd already poured tea for most of us, and he gave refills to those who wanted it. Now, in 18, it says, wives, submit to your husband as is fitting in the Lord. If you play a word association game with this, uh, you get a lot of negative ideas like doormat, inferior, control, put downs, rejection, fear, belittle, pushed around, threatened, servant. Not a very positive uh, type of thing. But it says... Um, that wives are to submit. And submission is not isolated to wives. Uh, Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke 22, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And in 1 Peter 2, he said, we're all called to submit to governing authorities. And in the body of Christ, believers are to submit to one another in Ephesians 5. Now, John Piper defines submission in marriage as the divine calling of a wife to honor and affirm her husband's leadership and help carry it through according to her gifts. Honor and affirm. But notice that there must exist something positive before the honor and affirm. Something that she's honoring, and that's leadership. Leadership precedes honor and affirm, and the man has to show leadership. Leadership has to be present already. And it's interesting, too, that the way God made us is men need to be honored and affirmed. They need that support. We have fragile egos. Men are called to love their wives, to sacrifice for the lives, their wives, to put their wives above self. And in that leadership, we receive honor and affirmation. So what is leadership? Well, I like Eisenhower's definition. He said, leadership is the ability to get others to do what you want them to do without having to ask them to do it. Eisenhower showed by personal force of character the united goals of many nations in an effort to, to defeat the Axis powers. A remarkable man. Now, when a husband is a leader, the family is all on the same track, spiritually, financially, socially, educationally, and emotionally. It's his job to pull the people together in the family to be on the same track. And in so doing, he's to bring out the best in everyone. Thus, the key words in this whole passage is in 19. Husbands, love your wives. Be sacrificial. I recently read a quote from Eli Weitzel, who was a psychologist who uh, survived the concentration camps in Germany. Here's what he said. Hate is not the opposite of love. Hate is not the opposite of love. It's indifference. Don't be indifferent. That Indian husband was indifferent. In 21, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And provoke is to stimulate or excite, this is uh, one of the dictionaries, to do or feel something, especially arousing anger in them. It's to deliberately make someone annoyed or angry. Instead, the family should be the center for caring, healing, learning, and growing. Paul raised the status of children to unthinkable levels of equality. And in India, as in any country, our future depends on education. We visited a school way out in the country where the tour company invests in desks and chalkboards and the like. And their challenge is to circumvent the graph. Uh, the what I'll call managers, the officials, the politicians uh, who want to get the money themselves and then give what's left over to the schools. Uh, this organization gives it directly to the school. And uh, these children are sitting on desks that were provided by this organization and have a chalkboard to the back there. And here's one to be mounted. And I thought it was interesting as we uh, visited this school. Here are these boys standing out front. Now he's 
obviously enrolled in a school. He's got a uniform on. But we asked him why these two guys weren't in school. We never got a good answer from him. <laughs> Playing hooky is universal. But the family should be the place where children are encouraged and expected to go. Uh, and, and we're not to provoke our children in doing that, but make them want to go. And then in 23, it says, whatever you do, work heartily for the Lord and not for men. Now, interestingly, in India, there's no sense of philanthropy. Karma reigns supreme. No philanthropy, no trying to do something for people just because people need it. Now, people do put grain out for animals on the street. Uh, this actually is in the area of a mosque, and you can see here a lot of grain spread out for the birds. Uh, and we saw it on the streets and the sidewalks where they put this out. And the cows do wander around in the street. Pigs also wander in the streets. Dogs on the sidewalk. I felt so sorry for this cow. Look at all the flies around the face. It was absolutely incredible and all this cow is doing is eating out of the garbage they put out the food for these animals because it's good karma it's not good karma to give to a poor person because they earn their poorness or physical deformity from bad karma in a previous existence people do give to a temple to earn good karma but they don't create a charity because that doesn't earn good karma. The poor, poor, because that's who they are. Now contrast this with what Paul says. Work heartily as for the Lord, not for men. Or the NIV says, whatever you do, work at it with your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And the, medicine, and the message by Peterson is, is work from the heart for your real master, for God. <laughs> Work for the heart for your real master, for God, confident that you'll get paid in full when you come into your inheritance. Keep in mind always that the ultimate master you're serving is Christ. There's a subtle difference with karma. We're working for God for his pleasure, and there will be a reward. But the motivation is service, not the reward. We've already been rewarded through grace, a gift, eternal life. I, eternal life, began when I accepted Christ as my Savior. I'm living that now. So we've been rewarded, and a servant expects a fair proportional treatment. But grace is not proportional. Grace is not proportional. We don't deserve what we're given. Karma is fatalistic, and it's very insensitive. Thus, there really is no sense of philanthropy in India. The message that the Indians need to hear is Jesus paid their karma. The debt's paid. Normally, I'd ask for comments. And just think about what's been said. You know, when I travel, I, I, I pray less. I read the Bible less. I get preoccupied. But I think I praise God more because of the thanksgiving that I live in this time, in this place. I am blessed. So I look for opportunities to witness, but I try to use wisdom and not to offend because I don't really know the people around me. So I try to listen as much as I speak, and in that way, I learn about my fellow travelers. So I better know how to answer each person according to their needs. I do, though, want to reflect unequivocally what I believe. Now, uh, in the last portion, and I was talking here about being steadfast in prayer, in prayer and thanksgiving and we walk in wisdom we season what we say with salt and salt was important back in the Roman Empire sometimes soldiers were paid both in gold or coin and salt because salt could pre preserve food it could pres uh, preserve leather 
and had a real a value. Now, I don't know whether it was that was true in Judea because they had the Dead Sea nearby where they could mine salt. But in other parts of the empire, the salt was very important. Um, through the ages, uh, people have been measured with salt. There's an ex idiomatic expression, he's not worth his weight, or he's not worth his salt, I should say. Uh, and another one is to be beneath the salt, because salt was used on the table of the king and the nobles. But if you were less than a noble, you sat further down the table beneath the salt. You didn't earn or you didn't um, expect to get salt to season your food. So it was used as a status symbol. Well, let's move on to the last section. And I'm not going to read this. You can read along with me. And I'm just going to mention some of these people on the honor roll. Don't you wish your name were on God's honor roll? Well, Tychius is mentioned four times in Acts 20. He's a Thessalonian in Macedonia who accompanied Paul. And after the debacle with the silversmith in Ephesus, uh, he was mentioned. And in Ephesians 6 and 2 Timothy 4, he was sent to Ephesus to report on what Paul was doing. And then in Titus 3, he was sent with Artemis to invite Titus to visit Paul. Now, of course, Onesimus is mentioned twice. He's the slave for whom Paul wrote Philemon. Aristarchus is mentioned five times. Uh, Paul uh, was confronted by a silversmith in Ephesus, and the crowd dragged Gaius and Aristarchus, who were Macedonians and traveling companions, out to try to, <laughs> to deal with them. And in Acts 20, he's mentioned along with Tychius, uh, and in 27, he sailed with Paul when a centurion took Paul back from Jerusalem to Rome to stand trial. Actually, I shouldn't say Jerusalem, from Caesarea Maritima. He's also mentioned in, uh, in Philemon, along with Mark, Demas, and Luke. Now, Mark is mentioned eight times. He's a cousin of Barnabas. He abandoned Paul on the first missionary journey, and he wrote the Gospel of Mark. Um, justice is mentioned one time. Now, uh, other justices are mentioned in the Bible. There's Joseph called Barsabbas in Acts 1, also called Justice and Matthias. They were uh, put forth, Matthias and this justice, to replace Judas. And, of course, Matthias was selected. And in Acts 18, there is Titius, Justice, in Corinth, different person. Epaphras is mentioned three times. In Colossians 1, he's credited with the introduction to Colossians as a teacher and minister. And then in Philemon, he's mentioned in the conclusion as a fellow prisoner in Jesus Christ with Paul. And then Luke, he's mentioned three times. Second Timothy, it says, Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you for he is very useful to me for ministry. That's the Mark who abandoned Paul, and now they've been um, what's reconciled, and Paul wants to have Mark by his side. Luke's also mentioned in the farewell at Phile in Philemon, and uh, he did write the majority of the New Testament, Acts and the Gospel of Luke. Now, Demas is mentioned three times. Second Timothy 4 says, Demas, in love with the present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Sad commentary. In Philemon, he's included in the greetings along with Mark, Aristarchus, and Luke. Now, Nympha is mentioned once, and it's a Greek name, female spirits that were in the forest were called nymphs. And uh, they're part of the retinue of the uh, gods like Artemis. And so it's an interesting name, but we don't know anything more about this person. And there's Archippus mentioned twice here and Philemon in the greetings. Now he talks about the letters going to Laodicea and Hierapolis. And I just included this to remind you, you have Ephesus down here. There's a mount, there's Ephesus. You have a mountain range here. And this is the Meander River that meanders up towards Hierapolis. And there's a branch right here. And here's Hierapolis. You can see the salt there. There are ponds where you can bathe, very brackish water. 
Here's Laodicea nearby and Colossae, and they're at the foot of this mountain range. There are all kinds of faults that run through this area, and so it's known for earthquakes. So here we finish the book of Colossians, and uh, I'm going to move on to a final insight and return to the Sikhs. I found them to be fascinating, and one of the highlights of my trip to India was going to the Golden Temple, which is the holiest place for the another collar blocked. Uh, it's a holy place for uh, the Sikhs, and the Sikhs began with uh, Guru Nanak Dev in around 1469. There we go, and there were ten. Uh, gurus that followed. The last guru said enough. Um, there would be no more. But bef uh, what happened is, first of all, the original guru traveled around India proclaiming that there is one God. He was the creator who had no birth, no death. He was not subject to space or time. And he doesn't take uh, birth as a human. Now, in India, that conflicts with their multiplicity of gods. They have Shiva and Vishnu and Brahman, and then consorts of the gods like Lakshmi, and uh, it is literally thousands and thousands. Well, he stood out against that. There's one God. And he also asserted that all humans are equal, including women. It was revolutionary thought. And when he went around, he uh, uh, had these short pants on. He had long hair, long beard. He carried a wooden comb to comb his hair and keep it neat. And he carried a sword for defense. And he also wore a metal bracelet. Some people have suggested that that bracelet, you can slip down and put it over your knuckles as a weapon. In any case, uh, there were five articles of faith, and uh, these five articles are in the upper left-hand corner, uncut hair, a wooden comb, you can see an example of wooden comb here, and the bracelet, and a sacred knife, and they come in different sizes. They've gotten smaller over the centuries because they just get in the way, and uh, it's become more of a symbolic thing. The uh, first of all, the uncut hair is a gift from God, and it um, it represents living in harmony with the will of God. The turban that they wear is not one of the requirements, but it is a form of identity, and it protects and covers the hair, and it is as much a part of being a Sikh as uh, the long hair is. Now, the wooden hair keeps it clean, and all of this promotes a social identity and cohesion. The bracelet is to represent restraint from evil, uh, or restraint from evil deeds. And you have to wonder whether it was also some sort of weapon at one time. And the sword symbolizes dignity and self-reliance and readiness to defend the weak and the oppressed. It's a willingness to sacrifice oneself to defend the truth. And Sikhs have made it throughout history some of the finest regiments in the British and the Indian Army. Then the shorts symbolize a faithful life. It reminds a need for self-restraint over passions and lusts and desires. Now, the Guru Nanak Dev, who started all this, preached three rules. Remember God, that's meditation and prayer, and to live honestly, and to share with the less fortunate. Philanthropy. He had five traits, were truth, compassion, contentment, humbleness, and love, and five vices, lust, anger, greed, ego, and emotional attachment. The Sikhs are vegetarians, and they believe in baptism. Uh, one is baptized with amrit, which is the word for nectar. This water that surrounds the Golden Temple is called amrit. The town that they live in is called amritsar. All of that means nectar. And, they, and the baptism is given by five baptized Sikhs. 
Now, uh, Guru Gobind Singh, the uh, last guru, 10th, said no more. And so he compiled the writings of all the previous gurus into a book and commanded that the Sikhs revere the book as a body in the spirit of the 10 gurus. This book called Guru Granth Sahib is, has 1,430 pages with 5,864 verses. It begins with this, uh, this writing, quote, God is one. He is the supreme truth. He is the creator, is without fear and without hate. He is immortal. He is neither born nor does he die. By Guru's grace shall he be met chant and meditate on his name in the beginning he was the truth throughout the ages he has been the truth he is the truth now and he shall ever uh, and he shall be the truth forever he is the truth the way and the light about salvation they say those who meditate on God attain salvation. For them, the cycle of birth and death is eliminated. And they have a daily prayer. There is only one God. His name is Truth. He is the Creator. He is without fear. He is without hate. He is beyond time. He is beyond birth and death. He is self-existent. Only He can be worshipped. Well, the uh, Sikhs believe in reincarnation and karma, but they reject the caste system. So to be a Sikh, what's necessary is a person who faithfully believes in one immortal being, the ten gurus from uh, Guru Nanak Dev to Guru Gobind Singh, and they believe in the Guru Granth Sahib, which is this book. The utterances, and they believe in the utterances and teachings of the ten gurus written in this book, and the baptism bequeathed by the tenth guru who does not owe allegiance to any other religion. Now, I want to show you a few pictures that really struck me. When we, uh, we actually arrived at night, and I'll show you some of those pictures. This is the daytime, and the Golden Temple, which sits, sits in the middle of the Amrit, or the Nectar, and you can see this picture from Pinterest for an aerial view to get an idea of the size. It's uh, covered with gold, and this spear, whenever you see that, that symbolizes a temple. To be a temple, you have to have a copy of the Guru Granth Sahib, which is the book. I'll call it the book, easier to say. Uh, you have a complete copy of it. The original is in the lower portion of the temple here. Uh, the visitors are allowed to go through and see a copy, as are all the other books, and they approach along this path. We were offered the opportunity to go see the book, but the waiting line is typically three to four hours, so we declined. Once uh, people arrive, they go in a clockwise fashion around this area. Uh, in here, people can sleep. Uh, they were sleeping when we arrived at night, 10 o'clock at night. There were a lot of people sleeping there, They're all volunteers. And they will provide room for people from out of town. But what they believe is that you can't worship God on an empty stomach because your mind will be on your stomach and not on God. So they provide free meals. Uh, here's an example of one who's in the Amrit or Nectar praying to God. So they provide over 100,000 meals a day. Uh, as we came in here, they offered us a plate, which we tried to graciously decline. But here are all the plates that they keep refilling and the silverware. And over here, we walk by and there are hundreds of people washing the dishes that have been used. You have groups here that are, in this case, they're going to go through the cabbages right here. They're, they're cutting up garlic. And here are a bunch of men sitting around cutting up um, ginger. They use these 
huge vats. See, this guy is probably 5'5", five, 5'7", five, five, and he would be swallowed up in that vat. They have three of these going making dal, which are lentils. So here the guy is pouring it in. Large wood fires. I, I, where I took this people, picture, it was really hot. It's already 100 degrees out. And there they are cooking. They take these big wads of dough. They make balls. And then each person puts it on a little platform and flattens it. And then they'll put these on a fire or a skillet and cook them and then collect them and distribute them. Here they're making other foods for the people. And so they'll bring them into these large halls and they line up along like that. And individuals will come along and serve each person putting food on their plate. When they're done, they all leave and then they come in and clean up and a Zamboni-like machine goes through and cleans the floor. 100,000 people a day, 24 hours a day, they serve people. And then you can join the group that walks around. They have in two corners these large screens, which in Sanskrit, Hindi, and English tell you what is being chanted over the loudspeakers. And it's very pretty music. It's very soothing music. Now, this is at night when we arrive, 10 before 10 o'clock, actually, uh, at the Golden Temple, where the book is. And uh, we stood in a location where I literally could have reached out and touched this gold gilded chariot. And here they're taking the bed linen off and putting fresh bed linen on. And this is to carry the book they cover it with flowers. They go back to the temple, get the book, put it on. It's very hard to see in this picture, but here's the book right here. They carry the book to up this area where it will spend the night. Since it is a living guru, it needs to have its rest. And so they put it up here and they fan the book all night long as a sign of allegiance. Uh, or veneration. Uh, these are the gentlemen who are chanting, and as I said, 24 hours a day they're doing this. Now, the importance of the book is so great, they have these reading rooms all along here. This is only about a third of them, uh, where they are reading the book. And if you want a special family blessing, you can pay to have the book read for you. Whenever the book is read, it must be read in its entirety, from cover to cover, in uh, continuously. So these um, Sikhs will come in for two hours and read, and then they'll be replaced. Uh, we wanted to be respectful, and um, I was surprised when my uh, one of my fellow travelers was signaled by one of the Sikhs. He held up his hands like this, you know, like take a picture. And so we took pictures of them. Here he is turning turning the page. Um, here's one. Now they have beds for these books. These are copies. Um, when it's not being read, which is rare, they will put it to bed. I thought it was interesting too. They have a clock on the wall. Uh, and of course they take donations for the temple. At this point, I would ask for comments, but I just want to remind you that uh, the Guru Granth Sahib, the book, is a living guru, and it's the embodiment of divine light and respect and veneration, they say, does not imply idol worship. I'll leave that to your, to your decision. But it is a monotheistic religion that venerates very highly the, the that book and if you have the opportunity to go to india do include the golden temple there i saw very few westerners there so may god richly bless you amen